So what we see here now is however Lamech what was going on in his mind to commit the second recorded murder in human history, it, it was carried out because he drawed reference from the first murder. So we see a lot of shootings that are taking place, and they almost seem to be copycat shootings. And, and I say that to say this, I think that many people are seeing or drawing references from previous acts of violence, and I think that's why it's really spreading, because they're saying, okay, this is how this person dealt with it. This is how this person was being treated. This is how this person felt. And it seems like this is how they got their revenge. And so they, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a, in my mind, there is a sense of each murder is drawing some type of reference point from the murder that happened before. And, and so if, if that's the case, that means that the last murder is not the last murder, that there's somebody else somewhere drawing a reference point from the last murder that they can view as something that's similar to their situation. Uh, minister Walker, uh, let me ask you something. If, as, a, as, a, as a minister and as a man who, uh, motivation, who is a motivational speaker to many different people, when people come to you and they say, uh, when they come to you, as I, as I asked uh, Pastor Smith, if a young person comes to you and they said, I'm having problems at school or I'm, having, I'm being troubled or I'm being bullied, what is it that you can say to them that maybe can keep them from going over that cliff? Uh, that we have discussed with all these with all these school shootings, and 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 to say that you know the, it age apparently uh, does not seem to matter. Uh, in 1998, the West Side Middle School shooting that occurred on March 24th, 1998, in which 13 year old Mitchell Scott Johnson and uh, and 11 an 11 year old child, an 11 year old Andrew Golden, uh, shot and killed four female students and a teacher mm -hmm. at their school. Um, they, one of the students, one of the perpetrators, they pulled the fire alarm and what, they all ran out uh, into the yard as proper protocol for a school drill. And these two young men, these two young boys were waiting in the field somewhere. And as the students and teachers were filing out, they began shooting. Mm -hmm. and, and thus was the 1998 uh, massacre uh, for schools. If there is a young person who comes to you and tells you this and and the information is such that this person has serious intention to cause harm, mm -hmm. even though in the instance of Sean Creech, uh, who is legally required to report that information, do you fit in that same legal requirement even as a minister uh, to report that information if someone comes to you with that uh, with that notion to harm? Uh, certainly, if you if you get information like that, you're certainly legally uh, responsible to report things like that. But in, in, to answer your question, if someone, uh, you know, if young kids or uh, teenagers or whoever come to me, you know, it's okay to be angry. The scripture even says that it, we ought to be angry but seeing not. So the, 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 the problem is people in our society today in America, all over the world, as you said, you mentioned even India, is uh, the problem in the first place, they are not coming to people. You know, people are suppressing their, their, their anger, and then they just blow up in, instead of coming to someone and getting counseling or getting advice from people. So when they do come, I say, yeah, it's okay to be angry. You know, even the scriptures it says in Ecclesiastes, there's a time for war and there's a time for peace. Now, certainly, if someone comes to my house and tries to threaten my family, that's time of war, <laughs> you know. And so, but it, there's a time of peace. And so when, when, uh, when children get angry, you know, we m must let them know it's okay to be angry, but you must learn to control the anger, forgive people. You must learn forgiveness and all these types of things, you know. Yes, certainly, that's, that's a human emotion, anger. We all get angry at certain things. Certain things make us angry. But we have to learn to control that and be uh, in control, self-control, so that we won't go and do something stupid or kill someone or uh, do something that's going to be detrimental, which is going to bring consequences. Because that's the bottom line. If we thought about the consequences of what's going to happen, that will stop a lot of the violence that goes on. And so that's what I, would, I tell young people is think about what's going to happen if you do this. There are going to be consequences, whether they're positive or negative. Now, if you do, if you cause your anger to go further than it should, then there are going to be negative consequences. You know, and so those are the types of things that I, I tell young people.
It's interesting because, you know, even with school shootings, when we think of school shootings, we do think of things like Columbine or Virginia Tech or the West Side Middle School shooting or even Sandy Hook. But even there are shootings that do occur in schools where it's not a massacre type thing. It really is kind of a uh, uh, an isolated type incident. For instance, uh, just recently, just just last week, the Lone Star College shooting near Houston, Texas, uh, in which uh, two gentlemen got into an altercation with each other and a shooting erupted. And no one was killed, thank goodness. But this was not a shooting in which uh, in which someone was just randomly walking through the hallways trying to kill people. This was a really almost kind of an isolated incident. Uh, Dr. Ryder, I know that you you have some background as far as conflict and and how people kind of handle their situations. Why? I guess you can kind of help us answer this question. Why would somebody want to take out a gun in a public facility such as a, a university or any institution really of, of higher learning and pull out a gun, why, why wasn't that something that could really have just been talked about or just talked over? Um, I look at it as in terms of what they have in their toolbox, what they've been socialized, how to respond to certain things of conflict. So what you may find is, is that violence has become normalized in their um, intergroup contacts, um, in their intergroup relationships, so that that becomes their response. I actually have an example that I want to share with Michael Carniel in 1997 in Kentucky. He was a 14-year-old shooter. He actually wrote a paper talking about responding to bullying, and it was called The Halloween Surprise, and I just have to share it with you just to think about his response. He said, the preps attacked Michael first and for no apparent reason. The next day, Michael wrote, when um, none of the students involved showed up at school, everybody wondered where the preps were, but nobody cared about Michael. And he wrote this response in the showing his victimization it wasn't even considered an alert paper by teachers. Teachers had been trained to see alert papers in terms of suicide, eating disorders, and physical abuse at home. And so it showcases some of the ways that we've seen violence normalized. Not to just hold the media responsible, but we start to see these um, responses of violence being showcased in a lot of our um, social institutions and a lot of our relationships. So this may be their response or what's coming from their toolbox. Can the media, and I noticed you said the media, can the media really be blamed? Because there, is, there are instances in which people say, well, you know, there's too, many, there's too much violence on television. The FCC is not cracking down like they should. Music should be cracking, it's not being cracked down like they should. Can the media really be blamed for young people growing up violent? I don't like to hold the media fully responsible. I think there's other things that are happening in our primary relationships who we're having face-to-face -face contact with, our levels of emotional intensity at these micro relationships. Media tends to be secondary at this level, so there's other factors. David E. Reddick. Um, I'd like to chime in with where she's going. It's, it's, it's kind of a societal educational process, and everybody plays a part. You know, the old African heritage, it takes a village to raise a child. You know, and our village has just gotten bigger. We have the World Wide Web. We have uh, hundreds of channels on our television. <clears throat> parents are working. Par you know, now now the majority of kids that have two parents have two working parents in the home instead of one. And I think parents have, you know, some parents, it was so hard for the parent growing up that they began to uh, just give their kid everything. And when, when But when they were kids, they had to work to get everything they got. So we create this kind of a... Uh, selfish mentality in the minds of our children and then everything that's shown on television or that they see there's no consequence at the end at the end the, you know the good guy wins the bad guy loses and as long as they in their mind see themselves as the good guy there's kind of no consequences left over and then we create this um, self-involved selfish mentality inside of ourselves and I think that's how a lot of even self-violence like suicide somebody to commit suicide on YouTube you know, I think that's how a lot of that happens because the end result, because when we grew up, I was a, like in my in my home, in my family, I was a part of the family. So I had uncles, aunties, cousins, mom, dad. And those were all factors in my thought process. It, no matter what I did, I always knew that somebody else in my family would be affected by it. But now today, nobody's affected by anything but the person that's involved in that. And we have to broaden our scope and show more you know, as a society, show more the result of what this action is going to do and how it affects people. Suicide affects not just the person that killed themselves. There's a mother, there's a father, there's uncles, aunties, cousins, friends, all involved in this situation. So it doesn't tear down. And violence doesn't just tear down that person. It tears down 
countless people in every situation. You know, I noticed too, also that these young these young people who who commit these violent acts, they never for some reason seem to quote unquote fit this profile. They never seem oh you know every time we look up oh he was such a nice boy. Now sometimes in some instances they do fit the profile, such as uh, poet Nikki Giovanni said that uh, Sung Hyu Cho was a little uh, maybe around the way or off his rocks. But there are certain individuals who for some reason always slip past that radar that says red alert red alert this person is crazy this person has a tendency to walk into a building and kill a lot of people uh for some reason uh, like for instance uh, i can give you a perfect example the the two young men from the 1998 west side middle school shooting uh 11 year old andrew golden he came from a stable household he had a good relationship uh with both of his parents uh 13 year old mitchell scott johnson um they described him as being quiet but respectful. He was very active in his church. He was also a member of the youth choir. And this other young man, um, 15 year old, uh, the 15 year old New Mexico teen who was plotting, who was who was accused to have killed his family, and then was going to plot a massacre at Wal at the Walmart across the town. Very quiet you know, respectful kid, was very active in this church. And one of the things, too, and, and I know, like I said, I saw a lot of you raising your hand. I want to ask uh, Trace Fleming Smith, who is, uh, who is a sexual, uh, who is a sexual assault. Uh, a, uh, advocate. Yes, advocate. Excuse <laughs> me. I need to. Advocate. Yeah, victim's advocate. One of these young men um, in the 1998 West Side Middle School shooting, 13-year-old Mitchell Scott Johnson, it is, a, it is believed that by his attorney that he was sexually abused by family members. Is it possible that young people who are sexually abused, can they in turn become these violent people? Can they in turn uh, become school shooters? If it, do the two have a correlation, potentially? Well, I, I think what's important to really recognize just a couple of things um, out of out of what we were talking about just now, I, I think that there's an awful lot of negative stereotypes about people who are mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to pay attention to how very careful that is that they are already stigmatized enough that we need to be careful that when we're labeling, oh, well, they're just crazy and that's the reason why they did that. Um, I, I think we have to be careful about that because the thing is is that there are millions of people out there in, in our society who have mental illness that don't go up and shoot up the Walmart. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful about that. And, and, um, and then there are plenty of people who, who do shootings who have never once, like you've mentioned, ha come from stable backgrounds. Have We have over and over and over consistently seeing that they're not fitting that mentally ill profile. So we have to be kind of aware of that. But um, I, I think when you're talking about the idea that can somebody who has been victimized turn out themselves to be a perpetrator? I, I believe that it's possible, but I don't think that it's going to be every single person mm -hmm. out there. And that's another one of those negative stereotypes that we have and we see with people um, who are survivors, that especially when they're, they're male survivors, where they don't like to come out the fact that they've been victimized because they're so concerned that now people are going to, well, it happened to you. Well, now, well, that person's going to be labeled a perpetrator themselves, even when they would never, that thought process would never even enter their minds. So I, I don't, is it possible that bo that boy was a sexual assault survivor? Possibly. But is that the reason why he shot up a school? I, I couldn't tell you that. I don't know. And I don't, I don't know if anybody but him could answer that question. Pastor uh, first, me. I, I would also add to that is, um, you know, there are many things that can happen in a human's life um, that can plant a seed of rage, uh, a seed of violence, and um, a seed of revenge. And, you know, I think in our society that David uh, uh, brought reference to uh, the, the proverb, as it takes a village to raise a child, I think during the course of a person's life, um, that seed grows or that seed is uh, 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 dealt with or properly reframed based on uh, that person's interaction and that person's internalization of uh, the positive uh, uh, relationships that that person is able uh, to be a part of. Um, I don't think that somebody just wakes up that's perfectly, uh, perfectly uh, well-adjusted perfectly what we would call quote unquote not crazy 
uh, uh, quote unquote, and, and, and just doesn't act like that. I think that it's a seed that was planted in that person uh, for a long time. And I think it, it may have been, you know, longer for one person than the other. But end result is we see the fruit of a lot of seeds that have been planted in the hearts and in the lives of people. And sometimes it is a traumatic uh, instance uh, such as molestation or, or sexual deviance or